I know are joining us online. Um, magical, magical new world of hybrid events, which is suddenly useful on a day when there's both train and bus strikes. So well done to everyone who managed to get yourself here into the building. You are very welcome. Uh, like I say, my name is Rio. Uh, I work here at the Playhouse supporting our new work and our artist development. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to be partnering with Disability Arts Online uh, to support this artist, Letty. Uh, I'm going to do the boring bit, the housekeeping, uh, and then I'm going to hand you over to Colin. We've got about an hour together today, sort of in the structured bit. Uh, there's going to be about a 20 minute reading from the book, which Letty will tell you all about. Then we've got a Q&A session. We're also going to be taking questions through the magic of the online system, which I don't pretend to understand, but I believe in completely. Um, and then around 8 o'clock, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. There will be time then if you want to get your book signed. You can buy it over here. Uh, we take cash and card. Um, it's all going straight back to Letty. Um, or, no, that's a lie. If you pay on card, we take a 2% card commission. And if you pay cash, it all goes to Letty. So I'll leave that information with you. Um, if you want to grab a drink or anything, the cafe is going to stay open until half eight. Uh, and yeah, we would love to kind of stay around in and chat afterwards. Um, toilets, important information. Uh, there's various toilets along here, um, both accessible male, female uh, and gender neutral toilets. Um, we also have our multi-faith and reflection space upstairs, which is a beautiful, cool, dark room with very comfy chairs and mats. If anybody needs to take a break uh, and just be still and dark and lie down for a bit, you are very welcome. It's open throughout. Um, and if there's a fire, our wonderful front of house team will look after us much better than I can. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I will hand you over to Colin. Thank you. Uh, good evening and um, welcome everybody. I'm Colin Hambrook. I'm the founding editor of Disability Arts Online and um, it's a, a real joy to be here in the Leeds Playhouse. Uh, a small joy in life um, as Letty will uh, attest to the small joys in life in, in her book of hours and uh, really delighted to be um, introducing Letty. Um, she's worked with us over a few years now. She joined us initially in 2019 as part of our emergence uh, project in partnership with Shape and the Artist Newsletter. And uh, she produced a really beautiful project called Seaworthy Vessel, which um, was very much about emotional re resilience, which is kind of a theme through Letty's work. Um, and um, as well as kind of deep, quite philosophical kind of thought process, processes, which with Seaworthy Vessel kind of ended up in this really quite simple, beautiful origami workshop, which uh, she presented uh, on our Instagram pages and um, a, a workshop that kind of uh, encouraged people to use uh, the making of an origami boat as a way of um, honoring loved ones, honoring aspects of ourselves that we need to love. And um, yeah, it was very, very powerful, very moving, uh, quite a, a kind of simple kind of idea that uh, went through this long kind of philosophical process. Uh, which is kind of very much a mark also of the Book of Hours. Um, uh, Letty became a Disability Arts Online associate artist uh, with us in uh, 2020, just as kind of COVID hit. And um, uh, un unfortunately, she went through a, quite a serious M MS relapse which actually became material for the Book of Hours. And the, the beautiful thing about it is the humor that runs through kind of turning kind of quite a dark and difficult um, experience in, into, um, into light and uh, into a kind of reflection on the small joys in life. And with that, I will hand over to Letty, who's going to give you a reading and um, talk a bit more about that process. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. Um, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Letty. As Colin said, um, I've been the associate artist with Disability Arts Online for two years now. Um, no previous experience has really prepared me for how weird it would feel to sit here in silence <laughs> while people praise me. It's very, very unusual, but not unpleasant. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit tonight about my new project, Book of Hours. Um, I thought I'd explain a little bit how the project started and, and the place I was in when I started work on the project. And then I'm going to do some readings from the book and just tell you a bit more about how the project progressed. So as Colin said, in 2019, I received an emergence bursary from Disability Arts, Shape Arts, and um, AN, the artist newsletter. Doing well to remember that still. Um, and it was kind of the first large-ish piece of art funding that I'd received in my career. Um, so it was a really big deal for me. And I developed a project called Seaworthy Vessel, um, which was exploring the link between my great granddad, who'd been um, injured in the Second World War in the Merchant Navy, and an MS relapse that I'd had that had affected my hands. Um, and I'd written a book and folded just shy of a thousand origami boats, ultimately there was a thousand, um, all made with hand printed paper with writing from my journals and from my great granddad's journals. And as Colin said, it was a project that was all about exploring emotional resilience and using this concept of seaworthiness from ships as a metaphor for resilience in people. And we were all set to take it to uh, what would have been uh, possibly the highest profile event of my career. We were supposed to be doing an artist takeover at the Tate Exchange on the 21st of March 2020. Uh, no prizes for guessing. Um, what happened there. But I'd been doing a lot of really hard work for that, really pushing myself for that. Um, and I, as well as being one of the artists, I had been coordinating the catalogue that we'd put together with several other artists. Um, and I have quite a vivid memory of uh, I had quite an unpleasant illness the week that I was working on that because I take immunosuppressants, which is where you're all very kindly wearing masks tonight. Um, I'm quite susceptible to catching illness. So I'd got this horrible gastric bug, just we're friends, we'll be frank. Um, and so I'd been sort of sat basically on the, my bathroom floor, being sick on the toilet, being sick into the toilet, and then typing away at this artist catalogue, really pushing myself to be ready for this event. And then COVID happened and the event didn't happen. Um, and that suddenly that lesson that I've been trying to teach myself through Sea Lady Vessel of what is emotional resilience felt like a lot more of an urgent question. Um, at the same time, I'd just been invited to be an associate artist with Disability Arts Online. And all the projects that we'd been sort of discussing in the very early stages were things that involved travel. Um, I wanted to go places and see things and see things that weren't, you know, the spare room of my parents' house <laughs> and the bottom of my parents' garden. So I was already early March 2020 feeling quite lost because a lot of the, the big things that I'd been working towards had kind of uh, disappeared overnight. Um, so I was trying to think about what would I work on for my associateship that I could do at home in my house. Um, and at the same time, uh, April 2020, I started to notice uh, visual symptoms that I've had before, um, sort of colorful disturbances in my field of vision, which because of the experiences I've had in the past, I knew meant that my retina was bleeding and that I was having an MS relapse. Um, and obviously, it was a very chaotic time. All the stuff that you would normally do uh, when you started experiencing those symptoms, ring the hospital, get a photograph taken of my retina, have an MRI scan, potentially have some emergency medication, none of that was available to me. Um, and I was very sensitive to light. I couldn't, when it was sort of at the peak of the symptoms, I couldn't have the curtains open, I couldn't look at a screen. So I was sort of, and I was sleeping about 
15, 20 hours a day because MS causes exhaustion as well. Um, so I was spending a lot of time in that very stressful time of the first lockdown um, on my own in a room with the curtains shut. And I had this one particular afternoon where I was finding it really hard just to, I think the thing that's hard when you're sick like that is sort of seeing to another moment. So seeing past that moment of, of pain, of suffering, I'm thinking, you know, tomorrow, maybe I'll be able to go outside and have an ice cream, wherever it might be. I was really, um, I guess, feeling quite claustrophobic and feeling like um, just stuck in bed and I wasn't sure whether it was night or day. And I was sort of thinking, I need something to think about that isn't, um, ow, my eye hurts. Like, I need another thought. Um, and I have a lot of audio books and podcasts that I listen to in that type of situation, but I, they just weren't working for me. I kind of listened to all my Jane audio, <laughs> Jane Austen audio books, um, and I couldn't concentrate on them, and I couldn't look at my phone to kind of download something else. So there, it was this real moment of crisis. Um, and that's when I remembered about this whole, sort of this whole idea came together. So I remembered about going on family holidays um, to Northumbria, which I went on with my family a lot as a kid, and going to visit Holy Island, Lindisfarne, um, and just that being a place where I was really happy. And I remembered that on the island, famously, there was um, St. Cuthbert, who was a hermit. So he started out on Lindisfarne, one of their most remote places that we can, that I've ever been. Um, and then he went further and further out into more remote caves to be a hermit. Um, and I guess I thought that if he could do that, isolate himself on purpose, he must have some kind of secret that I didn't have. Because for me, I'm a natural chatterbox. I like to be around people. For me, the isolation is part of what's really difficult when I'm unwell. So I sort of thought, well, he must know something. And those hermits must know something about how to be alone. And so I started to imagine myself as a hermit. Like, what would my life look like if I was a hermit? And I imagined there's these famous sheds on Mother's Farm that are made out of upside down boats. So I sort of imagined myself living in one of those. And I was thinking, like, when I get better and when I get well enough to be out in the world again, I'm going to be an art hermit. I'm going to really dedicate myself to the making of art the way an Anglo-Saxon monk was dedicated to God. And uh, it won't matter anymore that I'm unwell because I'll have this calling, right? And then at the same time, I remembered about books of hours. And I kind of misremembered about them at this point. But that's not really important. So I remembered about books of hours, and how I remembered them was as books that had a guide for every hour of the day, every day of the year. Um, and they told you how to pray. I'd have something to think about now that wasn't how much my eye hurt. Um, so I thought, when I get better, I'm going to put myself in that um, art hermitage, like St. Cuthbert and I'm gonna make a book of hours for people because I didn't want a prayer book. I didn't want one that told you how many rosaries to say at particular times of the day. I wanted a book that was made for, I guess, spiritually woolly artists, um, trying to figure out their place in the world, navigating disability, all that kind of thing. Um, and that's kind of the lofty ambition that I, merged, uh, that I emerged from lockdown and that period of ill health with the goal to make. Um, and that's where the idea for Book of Hours first came from. Uh, so I just thought the first thing that I would read is a profile that I've written of St. Cuthbert, who was one of the big inspirations behind this project, just so you have a bit of an idea of who he is from my perspective. 
Okay. So, St. Cuthbert, feast day, March 20th. St. Cuthbert was maybe a Briton or maybe a Saxon. He could have been a shepherd or a soldier who fought the Mercians or both. We know he had a vision that told him to go to Lindisfarne. We know that he was a famous hermit in his lifetime and even more famous after his death. The oldest book in Britain is Cuthbert's Bible. It says Cuthbert's book that fell into the sea on the opening page. He named his horse Comrade and shared all his meals with it. His best miracle, Cuthbert stepped onto land after walking ankle deep in the sea and two sea otters voluntarily used their fur to dry his feet off. Cuthbert protected all of the Eider ducks on the Inner Farne Islands when he was Bishop of Lindisfarne and allowed them to nest inside the Priory. In the Northeast, Eider ducks are still known as Cuddy ducks after the saint. As a kid on holiday on Lindisfarne, I was baffled how someone could live in the quietest, most peaceful place on earth and think, you know what this place could use? More windswept isolation. I used to think there must have been a monk on Lindisfarne with my personality, some over the top chatterbox who could talk anyone further and further out to sea. Hey brother Cody, what do you think of my new vestments? Too much? I was talking to brother John in the brewery just now particularly good batch of mead on at the moment, FYI. Anyway, he said to me, those vestments look a bit much. They could do with being itchier. He said that, you know, more mortifying. And I said, listen, buddy, some of us know how to itch in style. And wait, Cuddy, where are you rowing to? Cuddy, there's nothing out on that island. Reading about him now as an adult, I get it. He wanted to live a quiet life alone with his ducks. So that's sort of who Cuthbert was from my perspective. Um, and so from that point, I spent the next two years finding out more and more about him. This is what I've learned. Um, I think when I started the project, I was thinking about Cuthbert as something more than human. I think I thought that these Anglo-Saxon monks had like this discipline and access to this level of faith that if I had access to, it would allow me to transcend my suffering. Um, and what I've learned over the last two years is that they were just normal people. Um, and that was really interesting for me. As part of the project, um, I actually went and spent a week in Northumbria and visited Lindisfarne and learned all about the monks of Lindisfarne. And they were very much the same as I'm, just a person who would like to get up at eight o'clock in the morning and start making art, um, but actually gets up probably closer to 11 o'clock um, and doesn't start making art until maybe three and then stays up later than I should. Like, I always felt lesser because of that, but then when I started learning about Cuthbert and, and the monks of Lindisfarne, what I started to learn was that they were basically the same as me. So they were just people who had this unrealistic ideal that they'd invented for themselves and they couldn't live up to it. And they actually were having quite a cushy time on Lindisfarne. So we have this record of these like beautiful, a blue glass chess set that was recovered that would have been like the most expensive, like the equivalent of a huge Rolex watch <laughs> in Anglo-Saxon times. Um, and it was a pretty good life. And that's actually why, you know, the Vikings were tempted over because the Vikings were trading with them on Lindisfarne and kind of looking around and thinking, you know what, this is pretty good. And I don't think these monks would be that handy in a fight is probably the thought process that led to the first Viking raids. <laughs> um, so I started trying to develop my own version of kind of a monk's day um, as I worked on the project. Um, and I was reading about, I was relieved to discover that their concept of time wasn't our concept of time. 
So I'm someone who's always really struggled with like a 24 hour clock. And one of the things I really loved reading about um, these early monks was that their days were very much based more on kind of a rhythm. Uh, so they prayed eight times a day based on watch times. And when you translate those watch times, they have like really great titles. So the one that really stood out for me was uh, the first watch of the day translates to being at first bird song. Um, so I started trying to figure out my own watch times to kind of create my own rhythm throughout the day as I worked on this project. Um, and I started trying to figure out what the equivalent in my life would be. Um, so one of the watches that I end up using is called Artificial Dawn Chorus because my alarm clock is birdsong and it goes off at half past 11 in the morning. Um, so I started develop and I, I started to think like, what would my equivalent of praying be? Um, and I sort of redefined it as stuff that helped me connect with myself and with my own thoughts. Um, because I think one of the things I did realize was part of the reason, the thing that's hard about being alone in the dark when you're ill is that you're alone in the dark with yourself. So doing stuff to kind of make a bit more space to listen to myself when I wasn't ill was a thing that I thought would maybe be a healthy choice. Um, so that's when I started. Um, I can quite clearly remember the day that Colin Hambrook rang me up to see how the project was going and I said, yeah, it's going great. I've decided to write exclusively based on where we are in the phase of the moon. Um, so that was the first development of my watches that ended up being included in the book, was that I would write on days between the sort of half moon and the full moon. I'd write at different times of the day, and I would set um, an alarm on my phone for about half an hour to an hour. Um, and I'd just write, I'd sort of try and come up with a watch title of like, if this was a prayer time, what would this be called? Um, so some of them, well, one of the early experiment ones was called like, too early Zoom call watch. Um, uh, the, yeah, so I tried to do, one that was called time to quit Twitter watch. Um, I was trying to develop the different watch times and they, I suppose, became my version of praying throughout the project. Um, so the watch times, the watches that I've included in the book, I was just trying to include, I guess journal entries really is what they are to try and give a flavor of what it was like through that period of uh, 2020 to 2022 from my perspective as somebody with a chronic illness. So I thought I'd read one of the watches now. I put post-it notes in so I can find the page, but I'm still not that fast. <laughs> okay. Spilt milk of a day watch, 7 p.m., a Tuesday in April, 2021. Woke up, still groggy from a migraine two days ago. Made a coffee, went outside with no shoes on. I felt grateful for the cold rang the physiotherapist to make an appointment for him to look at my shoulder because, God, it hurts. And I just can't wait six months for, a six, for six sessions in Seacroft. His name is David. He thinks he can help me. But first, he wants to know, how did your MS affect you? Jesus, David, what an opening question. How is it possible for the universe to have no edge and also be constantly expanding? How deep is the gap at Brown's point? I don't bloody know, David. Some things are too big for words. Later on, fatigue rolling in like a sea fret, I try to claw back some victories from this spilt milk of a day. The bees have made a triumphant return to my lavender bush, and this is cause for hope. I rearrange all the furniture in my living room, decide I liked it better how it was, and put it back. I submit a poem for publication for the first time and remember that tomorrow a film of mine is being screened and tickets sold out before I could buy one. I have a little cry because my favorite takeaway place has stopped delivering to my house, but then I track it down on another website. That's the secret in this life. 
sometimes you just have to find another way around. So I think what's starting to emerge in that watch is what became kind of the theme. There's two things. Um, so one is I make reference to this idea, the gap at Brown's point. Um, I've written an essay about that in the first half of the book. Um, so the, gra the gap at Brown's point is a crack between, uh, sorry, my words are going a bit uh, slurred. A gap between two tectonic plates um, in color coats in, uh, or by Newcastle. And um, it's a place that I know about because when I visit my brother, uh, my little niece likes to read that particular information sign that explains where it is. So I've got the information about it quite well memorized. Um, but I think that's, so it's, the, it's a gap between two tectonic plates and no one knows how deep it is. Uh, it's called the gap at Brown's Point. Um, but I think that's an example of a phenomena when you're chronically ill, which is that you end up making meaning from the things that you have when you're alone in that room. Um, so for me, the gap at Brown's Point became a metaphor for the sort of deep uh, place with no distractions that you go to when you're sick and alone. Um, and I think for me, I guess what I started thinking about was how um, it became one of the themes in the book, this idea that you have what you take in with you. So the problems that come up, the painful things when you're sick, are the things that you take in with you. You know, the, the knowledge of your degenerative illness, the knowledge that you're in a pandemic, but also for me, like, the fact that when I was 12, someone I was at school with said I say the word worry weird, and I'm still not quite over it. Um, and that feels very stressful when you're alone in the dark for a long period of time. So that's all the stuff that I thought of as being down in the gap of Brown's Point. So I've kind of shoved it all down there. And then when I'm alone in the darkness, it, it comes back out and pollutes the rest of the water. But I also think it's, as a chronically ill artist, it becomes a thing of the things that I'm making meaning from are the things that I already knew about before I was alone in that room. So um, why did I think about St. Cuthbert and not, I don't know, like a Zen Buddhist or an influential rabbi or something? Well, because I grew up Catholic and I went on family holidays to Lindisfarne. Those were the things I knew about. Um, and then I kind of call in the book the, the place you go to in your head when you're alone for a long period of time with a sickness, the illness place. Um, so when you're in the illness place, you have to, I guess it's uh, like ration thinking, right? You have to make meaning out of the stuff you already know about. So I used the gap at Brown point, the gap at Brown's point, because I was already quite familiar with it, because I've read that information sign a lot of times. Uh, but then the other thing that I think starts to come out in this watch is this idea of um, savoring small joys, uh, which I, for me, is the kind of antidote to the illness place or to um, living with a chronic illness in general, or, or I guess just for anybody, just for all of us, is sort of savoring up. So I mention um, in that watch that I just read, I talk about the bees coming to lavender in my garden. Um, that's my favorite time of year, I think, to be sat in my little yard in Haworth. Um, I've got a big lavender bush. And it's always full of bees. And it's one of the things that I try to conjure up. And I actually have, so my bedding has bees on it. And I always put lavender oil on my pillow when I'm going to be feeling unwell for a couple of hours. So to kind of conjure that easier. Um, and it's one of the things I was quite interested throughout this project in, the idea of faith, um, but more as an act than necessarily what you have faith in. So for me, often when I'm unwell, one of the things I have faith in is that I'm going to be back out um, on one of those afternoons and that the bees will be back and that I'll be able to sit in the sunlight. And it's that sort of 
I mean, I'm even thinking when Rio was doing the introduction, she said, I believe in the technology. Like, isn't that just an example of how faith is so much part of our life? <laughs> because you have to, you know, you have to believe that this is going to work. And I think that's what um, I was really interested in this project when I was looking at people like St. Cuthbert isn't necessarily what they were believing in, but like, how do you find that faith as an action? And I do think it is a thing that um, the more you think about it, the more so many ideas in our society run on faith. Um, so like even money is kind of made up and we believe in it together or like the rules of a sport game there's so many things that that we're believing it yeah and that you know I have faith now that I'm talking and that there's people watching on that live stream um, so then in the latter half of the project I started there was a figure who kind of changed everything for me and really blew my mind um, as I was uh, I think it would only be this, sort of like January the 22 slash November 21 that I actually read about um, Julian of Norwich. So Julian of Norwich was um, a female uh, religious writer around the time, uh, the plague that we think about when we think about the plague. Um, and she survived a plague that killed half of Norwich and people speculate, including her husband and children. Um, and I was reading some of her writing and had this kind of revelation that we had experienced the same thing. So she started writing her writings that she called showings um, after a period of ill health. And I kind of had this revelation that we had both been to the illness place and come back with this sort of feeling of deeper understanding. And Julian of Norwich was kind of a really big deal um, because she was the first person to write about this idea of um, sort of a loving God, basically. Um, and she had this idea of um, that there's this thing, I don't fully understand it, uh, but she writes about a hazelnut and she had this vision while she was sick of a hazelnut and came to understand that if someone had made that hazelnut, you must love it and therefore God must love all the creations. And that was, at the time, that was, um, you know, probably like as big a deal as maybe Marxism or something. Like it was a huge revolutionary change in thought because so much of the church before that had been about suffering. Um, so that kind of fed in a lot to my research and thinking about uh, the way, I think we still have this idea a lot in modern society that you should, like, that it's good to suffer and that you should suffer for your art particularly. I made that link. Um, because when I read about these figures of like hermits and anchorites and anchoresses and all these people, uh, the thing that I really feel is that if they were alive in 2022, they would be like conceptual artists. They would like be Damien Hirst. <laughs> um, and um, I write about that in the book and some artists who've done really extreme things. Um, like one artist, I, the name is in the book, so that's your reason to read it, who um, like spent three days licking the wall of an art gallery until he was painting the wall with his blood, or an artist who destroyed everything that they owned in the name of an art project. Or I was thinking of Tracy Emin spent three weeks naked in an art gallery early in her career, which is a very modern hermit thing to do. Um, but it, it really made me think that that's an idea that I've kind of internalized, that I should be suffering for my art. And that um, kind of figuring that out, uh, the idea that you know maybe you can just have like a nice nap in the name of your art instead of <laughs> doing thinking back to like that foot before getting ready for that Tate event that I mentioned at the Tate Exchange. You know how much I was pushing myself and how much I was working through illness because and kind of thinking of that as I guess adding to the project in a way of like going for your suffering and then that making it better. 
Um, so that's when I really started thinking about this idea of um, not suffering for your art, but having joy for your art instead. And um, I started looking into the idea that I mentioned earlier of if what changes the illness place is the thing that you take in with you, um, can I have a, an effort while I'm out here in the world and not in the illness place to kind of save up nice stuff and nice memories to, to take back in with me? Um, and at, at the same time, I started noticing uh, flowers that were growing in kind of abandoned stretches of land all the time. And once you start noticing that, you really start noticing it a lot more. Um, and that's kind of what led to the last poem that I'm going to read and finish on, uh, which is the, the final poem in the book. Um, and it's called, find the page again. Um, So it's called Count It All Joy. And it's really, I think, the poem that sums up that idea of valuing joy instead of valuing suffering. Uh, so it goes, Count It All Joy. My neighbor's cat hitting the doormat with his eclectic plunder. A bag of chips from the fish shop. A book of farm food vouchers. A single glove. My grandma cutting the buttons off her blouse stashing them in an old sweet tin in the loft alongside 20 suitcases of assorted fabric she brought home when she worked on the market. You never know what might come in for something. I'm saving up tiny joys the way a bear fattens up for the coming winter, a patchwork quilt of ordinary leftover happiness to keep me warm through the darkest part of the night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks ever so much, Letty. Thanks, Colin. That was, uh, that was very powerful, uh, moving uh, explanation and reading f from, from the book. I, I, um, I kind of really love the way that your work kind of makes you think deeper, brings you closer to yourself and to that kind of reflective space um, it, within consciousness. And I think that's, there's a real power and a beauty in that that um, is, is something um, very important for, for everyone. I'm going to say a thank you to our audience and to everyone online. And we're going to go into a, a question and answer session. And so. We have the technology through WhatsApp to um, give our online audience a chance to ask questions which are going to, or comments, reflections, come through to my phone. Also, um, please, anyone in the audience, um, if you have a comment or uh, a question, then um, my colleague Trish here. Our wonderful Disability Arts Online CEO will uh, move around with a roving mic and um, relay your comments and questions up here. Um, and of course, I have to say there is a book for sale. Um, it will be available on the other side of the room at the end of the Q&A session. Um, it's also uh, available um, through uh, the online bookshop that Letty has set up. And, um, and of course, the book of ours, the book, is part of a bigger project, um, which Letty is also working with Dada in Liverpool and the Attenborough Arts Centre in Leicester um, to present uh, Anchorage which is um, Letty's own version of Tracy Emin's tent, which, um, unlike a tent full of uh, everyone that 
the artist has shared the bed with. It's a tent that is um, has a bed, but is filled with reflections on the illness place. Um, but it's also very much a, about about, about humour, it's about northern humour. And, and that, that, that is the, the kind of key to the Book of Hours, really, is that there is, there is this, this humour that runs through it. Um, and um, the first question that I wanted to ask Letty was, um, because obviously this has come out of quite, you know, a, a dark experience, a difficult experience, but you, 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 you managed through all this reflection to, to kind of hold on to this very wry sense of humour. And I wanted to ask what that, what that means to you. How, you know, you, you kind of, you're, you're grappling with the idea of suffering, but you're able to, to carry on laughing at the ridiculousness of it or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, um to a large extent, that's just my personality. I think that's the thing that's quite um, interesting a lot when we... The way I see MS talked about is that it's always this... Um, I call it the sad piano music, because you always, whenever MS is mentioned in the media, on the radio, on the television, there's always this sad piano music playing in the background. Um, and. I'm just not really a very sad piano music kind of person. And I think that's what we talk about in the disability arts, right? Is that getting diagnosed with MS didn't change who I am. Um, and I think I am the kind of person who can't resist making a joke in any situation. Um, I'm interested that you said Northern humor. Um, I suppose I would think of it as quite a, a specific kind of West Yorkshire flavor of humor. I think there's quite a different um, actually, I was writing an article um, for Disability Arts Online. I spoke to my friend, fellow artist, Bertio Gerada, who's from Hull. And she talked about like the big difference in culture between West Yorkshire and East Yorkshire, which maybe uh, from Brighton <laughs> is, is a mystery to you, but is that I think in West Yorkshire, everybody is always talking to each other, but more than that, always making a joke. I think about when I was doing my MA at Leeds College of Art, and I was back and forth on the train to Keithy quite a few times a week. And on, I know when you go down to London, it's like not the done thing to talk on the train, not the done thing to talk on the tube, but definitely when you're on the train between Keithy and Leeds, it's not just that everybody's talking, it's that everybody's kind of doing a skit for the people around them. Like everyone on the train is gonna wanna hear our best, story. like what is the funniest story from a shopping trip into Leeds? Uh, that all the other passengers on the train clearly want to know about and are eavesdropping. It's like, for you now, the West Yorkshire players <laughs> performing a skit about a mix-up over some knickers in Marks and Spencer's at New Pudsey. Um, <laughs> so I think it's, it's very much part of the culture here that everybody is always making a joke and everybody's always, I think in a good-natured way, taking the mick out of each other a little bit. Um, and that is the personality that, that I have. I'm, I'm very, in my family as well, it's uh, people always say like, oh, you're so loud, you're so confident, and that you talk fast. But the reason I talk fast is because in my family, if you leave a pause of longer than maybe 10 seconds, someone else is gonna jump in and maybe they're gonna like, get the funnier joke in that you were just about to say, which is obviously a travesty. Um, so I think, it's, developed, it's part of who I am, is that I am a person, but also a person who makes jokes, not just a person. Um, but also I'm a person who uses humor as a coping mechanism. I remember when I was first diagnosed with MS, I got sent um, three sessions with the university counselor. And in one of the sessions, she said to me, um, I feel like you use, I think you try to use humor as a coping method. 
And I said, are you trying to say that I'm not funny? <laughs> and she didn't laugh, which was obviously devastating. So like, when I was in hospital being diagnosed with MS in Bath, where it's not like this at all, I was cracking jokes all the time. You know, They were putting me in the MRI, and I was cracking jokes. And they were looking at me like, what's going on? Whereas I think if that had been in Leeds, you know, there would have been a bit of a bit of banter, yeah. So I think it's it's just a reflection of who I am, is that I am a person who makes jokes. And I've tried, I did try for a long time to not put that in my work, but um, I just can't not. <laughs> I, I liked the way that um, in, the, in, the, in the book, you, you, you know, you talk about um, when you had the relapse and, and, and um, and, and your leg becoming dodgy, and you turn that into a joke about the patron saint of legs. <laughs> and, um, it kind of runs, that sort of runs through. Yeah, it's, it's funny, because it's, it's not really a joke, joke so much as I actually did ask my friend in the hospital if she could go home and Google who the patron saint of legs was, because I think I grew up in that school of Catholicism where it's like not that strict, but still would feel better just to know. <laughs> who, if it came to it, who I would need to pray to. <laughs> um, can, I, can I turn to the audience? Do you, is, are there any questions? Trish. Trish. Okay, sorry. Um, I had the privilege of uh, having a look at the book beforehand today, and um, it's it's a it's a really wonderful object, and uh, yeah, just I really love the images you used in it, and I was intrigued to see the dates were kind of um, that are related to the images, kind of predate the beginning of the project, and I wondered if you could tell me about the selection of those images and, and the objects and what they mean to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so, with, I always, when I'm working on a project that's text and image, I always do the images last. Um, so I'd kind of been, uh, uncharacteristically for me, that's a lie, quite close to the deadline, getting this ready. Um, I was kind of thinking, what could I use? And I was editing the final section, which is about kind of joy. And I was thinking about also, I was referring throughout the project to, um, I had this book that my granddad had bought at a vintage book fair that was someone's personal book of hours from the 1860s. And throughout that book of hours, he had pressed flowers. Um, and I kind of had this uh, light bulb moment where I realized that pressing flowers is a way of preserving joy, which I felt like fit really well with the theme of um, what I was trying to bring throughout the book, which is this idea of preserving small joys. Um, and then I just kind of started thinking, what are other ways of preserving joys? And like, I started thinking about, um, the weird stuff that I've picked up on beaches of maybe 10 or 11 um, and saved for years and have these stories about. And I was thinking like these objects are ways of saving joy. So there is kind of a range throughout the book. Some are pressed flowers and then objects that I've found on beaches, which range from like um, sea glass. Uh, there's this rock that I call ghost rock that I found with my brother on actually on Lindisfarne. Um, and I kept because to me it looks like a sort of drawing of a cartoon ghost. I've just had it on my bookshelf for like maybe 10 years now. Um, and then there's also, uh, there's this, it's like a lobster claw and a plastic goat, which I found on the beach in Bambra with uh, the goat inside the lobster claw, which uh, in 2010. Um, so it's just like this, this selection of objects that I kind of realized I was keeping for, to keep that memory alive to, as a way of saving joy. Um, and it was amazing actually that I sort of had that idea of, oh, I could use stuff that was preserving joy and then looked around, I was like, oh, what am I gonna use? And looked around my studio and was like, oh, there's about 500 things here. Um, because I guess I've inherited my grandma's harder <laughs> tendency to just like hang on to stuff. 
Um, so that's what the images are throughout the book. And then there's just one um, page with a sort of a frilly mask card, which is actually one of the things that was in that original book of hours that I kind of referred through throughout the book. Great, thank you. Oh, we have a question here. Thank you, Letty. That was that was really interesting to, to um, listen to, and you know just how honest and and open you've been about that whole process. Um, I'm curious, not just about the book, but when did you decide or realise that you wanted to pursue an artistic career? Ah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you, Anna. Um, I think. So the first time I can remember being really intrigued by like conceptual art, um, I saw. Uh, my teacher had recorded on a videotape, because it was back in the 90s, um, this thing about an artist who I think was maybe nominated for the Turner Prize, but I'm not confident about that. And he'd made this installation where he said, he'd poured a glass of water and he said that he turned it into an oak tree. Um, and I was maybe 11 at this point, and um, I think they'd interviewed him on Newsnight and they'd done that kind of Newsnight style grilling interview where trying to get him to say that it wasn't an oak tree. Um, and I just thought that that was like really weird and great. And like, you can just say what you want if you're an artist. Um, so then that summer, um, I went on a trip with my family to London where my parents said me and my two older brothers could choose one day out each. And because I remembered about this thing and that it had been at the Tate Modern, um, I chose the Tate Modern as my day out. And when we were there, there was um, Cornelia Parker's Cold Dark Matter Exploded View, which is the exploded shed. Um, and I can just remember going into that room in the Tate with the sort of shed parts hung up by a string and just feeling like, this is amazing. And I also remember that um, there were, you were only allowed 15 people in the room at any one time. So my dad couldn't come in with the rest of the family to view it. And I was just like, if you're an artist, you can do whatever you want. Um, and I just thought that seemed like the best thing to be. Like you're just in charge of everyone and you can just do this weird stuff without making it up. And then I, didn't, I don't think I ever really thought of it as a potential career at that point. Um, and I kind of, I was good at art at school because I'm dyslexic. So um, visual art was the thing where not being able to spell didn't get in the way. So I kind of went down that road and did my BTEC in um, uh, art and design. And I was intending at that stage to uh, go into costume design and work in the theater. But I just kept, there was something about um, sort of con weird conceptual art that I just kept being like, that's just so cool. I just really like it. Um, so I decided to do my degree in art with creative writing because there were the two things that I loved and I still kind of didn't decide, but I just kept thinking like, I would really like to be an artist and, and not, you know, not like my dad in a room with a blown up shed. <laughs> that sounds like a fun thing. <laughs> and I sort of started learning about art theory and just thinking it was really interesting and like, it just worked with my brain that I was just really like reading the death of the author and the personal as political. And I was just like, yes, this is my stuff. And I think really then it was kind of once I was diagnosed with MS, uh, because I died with MS about six months before I graduated uni. And I knew that I wanted to be an artist, but I sort of thought, well, I'll have to have some sensible other career. And then once I was diagnosed with MS, I was like, well, if I've got RMS, I might as well be an artist and do the thing that I actually want to do in my life. Uh, so I think that's kind of how I, a sort of meandering journey to being like, no, this is definitely, if I've got to have a chronic illness, I'm going to do the thing that I actually want to do. Thanks, Letty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another question, and then I'll, I'll take some questions from our online audience. Thank you, Letty. That was really interesting. Um, so I've got two questions. Um, the first one is, is there a patron saint of legs? There is. 
Saint Sabiatus. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, this book feels like a really deeply personal one. Um, I'm just interested um, to know were there any challenges you faced writing the book and how you overcame them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, it is a very personal book, but I think I didn't, I, I'm at a point in my life, because I'm 30 now, I've been diagnosed with MS 10 years, where I feel quite comfortable talking about what it is to live with MS, what it is to have an MS relapse. Um, I did. I know there are a lot of artists who maybe talk about like relationships and their sex life and all that kind of stuff. That that kind of personal writing is not something that I would feel comfortable doing. But but talking about my illness is something. I guess in a way, I'd almost reached a point in my life where it felt like a relief to just be like, you know what, I'm going to do a writing project where I'm really honest about MS, because um, I think I'd spent quite a long time not being honest about the fact that it's hard and feeling like um, I needed to hide some of that and, and some of that for personal reasons, but some of that of like, well, you'll never get work if people know, you know how unreliable you are as an artist, all that kind of thing. Um, so it did feel like a relief, but that's not to say that I didn't struggle writing the project, because I definitely did. I think a lot of what I struggled with is um, some of that stuff I said before about, like, is it okay to put jokes in something like this? Is it okay to actually be myself? Is something that I do struggle with when I'm taking up space in the arts. Like, is it okay to write a book where I sound like I'm a person who grew up in Keithley and talk about my grandma and make daft puns, in, you know, and, and put that alongside kind of really serious, uh, also thinking like, is it okay for me to kind of take that pace, space for myself where I'm thinking like serious thoughts about the nature of reality and human existence and like, am I allowed to do that? I always struggle with that. And I struggle, it's funny because I think this project ended up being an exploration of faith and I think part of the reason it did that is because I've struggled with doubt a lot in my creative process. I find that I get horrible creative block sometimes and that is all because of creative doubt and I definitely uh, when I received the emergence bursary from Dow and it was my first piece of funding rather than that being like yeah I'm, I'm official I made it really triggered a feeling of like oh bloody hell I've scammed these people out of money and they're gonna figure it out um, <laughs> and, and I mean I even remember like the first I got a uh, email about the associateship and I didn't really know what to say back. I was like, so I replied, they said, would you be interested? And I replied and said, yes, please. And then it was COVID, so I didn't hear anything else for like two, three weeks. And I was at home like, well, that's it. I've screwed this up now. They're, they're not gonna, I wrote the wrong thing in an email and I can't think of what else to say. And they're definitely like cons taking the associateship back because I don't know how to write emails. Um, so that kind of doubt is definitely something that I struggle with and uh, that really came into my practice through starting to get funding in a weird way because I felt like this has to actually be good now. Um, and I think a lot of what I write about in the book is about this relationship between creativity and faith and that you kind of have to have faith in yourself to make a creative piece of work. Um, so I think the, the project was also kind of figuring out that and overcoming that of like, how do you get past that creative doubt? Thanks, Letty. Thanks. We're kind of drawing to a, to a close a bit. But, um, I'm just going to give one, uh, one comment from uh, our online audience and, and the one, last, one last question. Yeah. Um, so Joanne Connolly says, uh, I love how your sense of humour resonates through your work. I'm going to use the gap at Brown's Point as a metaphor, which I, that, that also resonated with me very strongly. And the question from Aidan Mosby is um, that you have a very definite voice that adds colour 
to your words and a real presence and have you thought about rather than using your written voice in your work your your spoken voice it's something that i am just starting to look into so um i had a quite a big revelation when i was working on that instagram takeover that colin mentioned for see where they wrestle where i did a sort of video where i was folding and kind of told the story of the project over the top and really noticed that people really connected with my work more when they could hear me talking about it at the same time and that definitely interested me in starting to look into film work and audio work where i can use spoken word um, and i'm also working on developing a storytelling project um, 30th of June, Haworth Old School Rooms, if anybody feels like coming, uh, with the Bradford Producing Hub, which is uh, just a pure sort of performance project. And that's my first um, thing, but I'm definitely interested. I feel like storytelling and spoken, uh, I don't really even know what the word is, but spoken performance is, is definitely part of the future of my practice. Thanks. And of course, the five watches, the kind of short, uh, film pieces that you created that are part of Anchorage um, are also, uh, I think the link to them is in the Zoom, so they can be viewed online. Yeah. Uh, and we've, we've had them on show here today as well. Thank you ever so much, Letty. Um, I l love the kind of the honesty and the, and the depth in your work and really look forward to seeing how, how it develops and what you produce for um, uh, for Dada and in Liverpool and, and, and the Atomer Arts Centre. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone for coming and to all of our online audience as well. Um, it's, it's been a really interesting and, and, and great project to, to, to work with you on and books will be on sale over there. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask everyone to continue to kind of bear social distancing in mind and, and wearing a mask, moving around. Um, thank you ever so much. Well done. Thank you.